Now we touch something what usually happens suddenly and is the biggest tragedy for families and one of the biggest economic burden worldwide. This is stroke. Nine of 10 strokes are avoidable. The main risk factors include undetected cardiac rhythm disorders, primarily atrial fibrillation, AF. Early AF detection and intervention is the core aspect to avoid this strategy. Professor Paulus Kirchhoff today will speak about technology enhanced remotely guided screening for atrial fibrillation, what we know and what we need to find out. Professor Paulus Kirchhoff is living and working in my lovely hometown, Hamburg. Paulus, it's your stage. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to um, speak to you about uh, uh, atrial fibrillation. And as you said, it is an important part of um, the cardiovascular disease continuum and an important part of uh, public health prevention. But I also think that um, atrial fibrillation is almost an exemplar that can illustrate how technology can, on one hand, enhance and improve diagnosis and care of patients, but on the other hand, how important it is to carefully evaluate every new tool, whether it is technologically enhanced or not. So I'll spend the next 30 to 35 minutes speaking to you about um, technologically enhanced, remotely guided screening for atrial fibrillation, what we know and what we need to find out. My experience, my talk is based on my current position at the University Heart and Vascular Center UKE Hamburg also um, on the uh, uh, work that I did at the University of Birmingham and in Birmingham um, over about a decade, and uh, uh, on the experience that I had at the University Hospital Münster, where I trained beforehand. These are my financial disclosures, as is now common for um, academic speakers. None of them influence what I'm going to tell you. I want to talk about five aspects. I want to briefly show you how beautiful our atria, a small part of the heart, but an important part of the heart are, and how much they get damaged when they suffer from atrial arrhythmias. I will then briefly cover how we can prevent strokes with anticoagulation and will spend a few minutes on a recent study that we've just reported that shows that rhythm control therapy, so the actual prevention of atrial fibrillation, can further add to stroke prevention once we have diagnosed atrial fibrillation. And then I'll tell you about screening for atrial fibrillation and why it can actually help to improve stroke prevention. And then I'll talk about uh, technologically enhanced screening. Learning from device experience, so experience that heart specialists have with implanted devices, and then talk about the emerging area of consumer electronics. This is a picture of uh, the two atria. Um, uh, well, uh, when you shine a light through them, you can appreciate how beautiful they are. They are an amazing structure because they work continuously throughout our lives. When the heart stops beating, life stops. And uh, even though we are amazing engineers and scientists, we have yet to devise an engine that works for 80 to 100 years without ever stopping. Now this beautiful, highly organized, very complex structure turns into something much different. And these are biopsies taken from patients with atrial fibrillation when atrial fibrillation develops. And you can even with the bare eye see that the um, red color that identifies the heart muscle is exchanged for something that's yellow or whitish, typically fat or fibrous tissue that does not function anymore. How can we prevent atrial fibrillation? Now, there, are, there are a few things that we already knew for many years, actually many um, centuries. Sufficient physical activity, a balanced diet, which in our times means don't eat too much. Sufficient sleep, moderate alcohol consumption, potentially actually abstinence. Um, avoid or compensating for abnormal stress. There's a sixth factor that helps to prevent heart disease, stroke and atrial fibrillation, and that is not smoking. We only know about this in Europe for the last 
100 to 200 years because we didn't have wide ranging access to tobacco before that. We of course have many medical interventions that can help us to protect the heart against atrial fibrillation and to protect the heart against atrial fibrillation induced damage once it develops atrial fibrillation. These include not only blood thinners or anticoagulants, but also antiarrhythmic drugs, AF fibrillation, um, treatments for heart failure, treatments for diabetes, treatments for hypertension, where we as cardiologists currently le learn that these um, medical treatments have interacting factors. For, so for example, that anti-diabetic substances can prevent heart failure, that atrial fibrillation treatment can prevent heart failure, or that heart failure treatments or antihypertensive treatments can prevent atrial fibrillation. For this to implement and to become fruitful for patients, we have to diagnose atrial fibrillation first. What are the key treatments that we can and should use to prevent strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation? They are anticoagulation and rhythm control therapy. The former is well established and I will not say too much about it, but I think it's important to cover this. These are summarized data from the 1990s. Only 25 years ago, we didn't know that anticoagulation prevents strokes in atrial fibrillation. But now we know that at least two thirds of all strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation can be prevented with anticoagulants. This was initially studied with warfarin and vitamin K antagonists, but we now have other easier to use and safer substances. The yearly stroke rate without anticoagulation is really high, up to one in 10 people per year. And it drops dramatically to 1.5, maybe 1% of patients per year in those who take anticoagulants. And the risk of anticoagulants is of course the risk of bleeding and particularly the risk of bleeding in the brain, intracranial bleeding, but that is much lower. And that is actually one of the reasons why the newer substances called NOACs appear safer than warfarin and are now the standard of care. And this is a picture from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines on atrial fibrillation management that summarizes this nicely. It is called the ABC scheme and it says, Anticoagulation is the cornerstone of management of patients with atrial fibrillation. It should be combined with B, which stands for better symptoms, and we'll come to that in a minute, to assess quality of life and improve quality of life, and C, to treat concomitant cardiovascular conditions and comorbidities. Now, we have just published a paper that I think will change the value of this column B. And this is the title page, it's called Early Rhythm Control Therapy in Patients with Atrial Fibrillation. It was the primary outcome of the early treatment of atrial fibrillation for stroke prevention trial, where we answered the question, does early rhythm control therapy improve outcomes compared to usual care in patients with early, recently diagnosed atrial fibrillation at risk of stroke? We randomized patients with recently diagnosed atrial fibrillation. So within the first year of the first detection of atrial fibrillation and stroke risk factors to either usual care, that's anticoagulation, rate control, treatment of concomitant conditions and rhythm control therapy only in those who remain symptomatic on these initial treatments or in blue to early rhythm control therapy, which is the same background therapy plus an antiarrhythmic drug or AF ablation in all patients at the start. And the hypothesis was that early rhythm control therapy may improve outcomes compared to usual care. 2,789 patients were randomized across Europe in 11 European countries, half to early rhythm control, half to usual care. All of the patients were analyzed in the primary analysis. That's an important technical aspect. The mean age was 70 years. A third of the patients were asymptomatic. That is, I think, of particular importance for our topic because they would have never come to a healthcare professional to say, I have a problem because they didn't even know and notice that they had atrial fibrillation. Almost all of the patients received anticoagulation. That's an important part for this therapy to work. The patients randomized to early rhythm control received antiarrhythmic drugs in the majority of patients and 20% of patients 
had undergone an AF ablation after two years. And the patients in usual care hardly received any rhythm control therapy at the start. And as is now practice, about 15% received rhythm control after two years. All patients were followed up for five years on average to see whether there was a difference in outcomes. The primary outcome was a composite of cardiovascular death, stroke, acute coronary syndrome, and worsening of heart failure. We stopped the trial at the third interim analysis due to um, efficacy. So after we had observed three quarters of the events that we thought we would need to get our answer, we already had an answer. And that happened earlier this year at the end of February, and we end, ended the trial on the 6th of March, 2020. 249 of the patients randomized to early rhythm control experienced the first primary outcome event, 3.9% per year. And that was 21% lower than the 316 patients who experienced the first primary outcome event in patients randomized to usual care of 5% per year. That was a clearly significant difference. Moreover, every component of the first primary outcome was numerically lower in patients randomized to early therapy. So cardiovascular death, stroke, but also hospitalization with heart failure and acute coronary syndrome. A clear overall benefit in terms of the primary outcome. We did an extensive subgroup analysis. I'm not going to go into the detail, but we did not find a subgroup of patients that benefited more than others. The effect of rhythm control, of early rhythm control, was obvious across all patients that were included in the study. One important aspect of care is, of course, cost. And one of the simplest estimates of cost of healthcare is mites spent in hospital, because hospitalizations are the main driver of cost in healthcare systems. And we therefore quantified mites spent in hospital as the second primary outcome of the trial. And this was not different between random groups, as you can see in this table. Furthermore, early rhythm control therapy was very effective. Over 80% of patients were in sinus rhythm two years after randomization. We did not see marked differences in quality of life, mental health, or physical health when, you, when we applied normal scores. The other important aspect of such an intervention is safety. And the good news is that early rhythm control therapy was safe. This was a concern before this study, because there were older studies that showed that rhythm control can lead to complications. And indeed, we found complications of early rhythm control therapy, but they occurred in very few patients at a rate of about 0.4% uh, per year. And they were balanced out by the fewer deaths and fewer strokes that we found in patients randomized to early rhythm control. So that in summary, Early initiation of rhythm control therapy reduced cardiovascular outcomes in patients with early atrial fibrillation and cardiovascular conditions without affecting nights spent in hospital. As expected, the early rhythm control strategy was associated with more adverse events related to rhythm control therapy, but the overall safety of both treatment strategies was comparable. And these results clearly have the potential to further inform the future use of rhythm control therapy thereby further improving the care of patients with atrial fibrillation. I'd like to thank everyone who helped us run the trial. This map shows you the areas of Europe where the trial was done. You can see that it covers most of Central, Eastern, Western, and Southern Europe. And we believe that early rhythm control therapy should be offered to all patients with recently diagnosed atrial fibrillation and concomitant cardiovascular diseases, in addition to oral anticoagulation rate control and therapy of concomitant cardiovascular conditions. Or to modify the current guideline picture, we may now have to add, change the name of the B column in ABC from better symptom control to better outcomes. But of course, this is just my idea and it has to go through uh, the correct process of uh, adjustment and updating of guidelines. So now I've told you what we can do 
when we diagnose atrial fibrillation with anticoagulation and rhythm control and treatment of concomitant cardiovascular conditions to prevent strokes and improve lives, actually save lives. Now, why is screening for atrial fibrillation so important? And I'll start with this patient whom I saw now over almost 15 years ago. It was a 75-year-old patient, a man, who presented with the signs of an acute stroke to the stroke unit at the hospital of Münster, where I worked at the time. And the imaging signs, you can see the CT here, the perfusion CT and the MRI clearly show the signs of an early ischemic stroke. Now, the ECG clearly shows um, atrial fibrillation. Sorry, I was too quick. And fortunately, because this patient's, patient received successful thrombolysis, he recovered well, so I could speak with him a few days later. And he told me that he actually felt breathless for seven days before the stroke. And this is a very typical symptom of atrial fibrillation, so that I am convinced that this patient developed atrial fibrillation seven days before this stroke happened. And it seems obvious that if one had only diagnosed atrial fibrillation then and started anticoagulation, this stroke could have been prevented. Now, this is only a case report, but when you do this, when you look systematically, and we did this a few years ago in Germany, where ECG screening is actually quite advanced, as you'll hear also in the next talk, we found that Every fifth patient who is admitted to a stroke unit in Germany has atrial fibrillation just by doing the ECG on admission. That was not known before. And if you then do a little bit of holdup monitoring for three days, you add another 4% of patient. So that one could claim that almost every 10th stroke that occurs in Germany or occurred in Germany a few years ago was due to undiagnosed atrial fibrillation. So there are many strokes that we can prevent with screening. Now, depending on how you screen and how long you monitor, you find even more. I'm not going to go into the details of these pie charts, but they basically should show you the number of stroke patients studied in uh, green or blue and the proportion of patients with previously unknown atrial fibrillation who were detected by ECG screening. And you can see that it goes from 5% to up to 25%, depending on how long you monitor the heart rhythm. We actually know this even more robustly from patients with implanted devices. You probably know that many patients have um, either a heart rhythm that is too slow and they need a pacemaker, or they are at risk of sudden death and they need a defibrillator. And these devices are implanted um, under the skin that monitor the heart rhythm throughout life. And when we look what proportion of patients with these implanted devices, where we have continuous ECG monitoring over years, have atrial arrhythmias, you find that almost half of them have atrial arrhythmias. And when you exclude those with known atrial fibrillation, you come to very similar numbers. So one in 10 up to one in four patients with implanted devices has undetected atrial fibrillation or atrial high rate episodes. Now, what can we learn from this group of patients that has been characterized so well? The first thing, and this is a paper that was published by my colleague Jeff Healy um, eight years ago, uh, he looked at uh, over 2,500 patients with implanted pacemaker and found that those who actually have these atrial high rate episodes, so these atrial arrhythmias that occur very rarely, they also have a higher stroke risk suggesting that one could maybe help them with anticoagulation. But we know that if you just give anticoagulants to stroke survivors, we do not help the patients. They do not help to prevent strokes and they just cause bleedings. And unfortunately, there was one study that tested whether intermittent blood thinners, intermittent anticoagulation could prevent strokes. They didn't show a benefit so that we are not really sure what the best treatment is of patients with rare device detected atrial arrhythmias, whether they should be anticoagulated to prevent strokes or whether they should be kept as they are because the bleeding risk of the blood thinners is too high. And this medical problem 
which is unresolved, is actually addressed by two controlled clinical trials. And one of my main messages in this talk is really that I want to convince you that we need to generate evidence that the screening-based technologically enhanced monitoring strategies lead to better outcomes before we implement them population-wide. So let me tell you this, uh, the design of this study. So it's called the um, non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants in patients with atrial high rate episodes epi uh, trial or NOAA AFNET6. It will randomize approximately 2,500 patients with implanted devices and with rare atrial arrhythmias detected on the device, but without ECG diagnosed atrial fibrillation. And patients will be randomized to either oral anticoagulation using one of the newer uh, anticoagulants, edoxaban, or to no anticoagulation. And they will then be followed for a primary outcome that is a combination of stroke or cardiovascular death. And there is a sister trial, if you wish, it's called Artesia, and it's run by the same group that published the first pacemaker study eight years ago. And when we've seen the results of those trials, we will know whether we should prescribe anticoagulants to patients with rare atrial arrhythmias. Now, why are these atrial high rate episodes or rare atrial arrhythmias different from atrial fibrillation? On the ECG, they look the same. And uh, uh, a wise colleague of mine, Jim Rifle, said that this can be summarized as magnitude synergism. It's a complicated word and a complicated concept, but I think it's important in the context of this talk. So we know for on, on one hand that atrial fibrillation patients, when they are young and without any other heart damage, they are not at risk of stroke. So atrial fibrillation alone does not cause strokes even though atrial fibrillation in most patients is associated with stroke, with stroke risk. Many of the frequently coexisting associated disorders, such as hypertension, heart failure, or atherosclerosis, have a stroke risk that is independent of atrial fibrillation. So they lead to stroke and to atrial fibrillation. So strokes in these patients can be due to atrial fibrillation, but can also be due to these conditions. These comorbidities also cause damage of the atrium. Remember the wonderful picture of the beautiful atrium that I showed you at the start and the damaged atria that uh, we find in patients with atrial fibrillation. So atria can be damaged and that can lead to clot formation in the atria and to a stroke. And thus, the stroke rate should probably increase when we have more atrial arrhythmias. So longer and more episodes, and when there are more, more comorbidities. And the findings of the EAST trial that I've just shown you beautifully underpin this content, concept, whereby a stroke reduction is found in patients who are treated so that they have less atrial fibrillation. So in summary, we know that we can detect atrial arrhythmias in device patients, but also with other ECG screening methods but we are not really sure, particularly when we monitor for very long, what treatment to offer these patients. So how does this transfer to this ama amazing emerging um, area of consumer electronics? Now the ESC guidelines say that one should use opportunistic ECG screening at the doctor's office or when a patient sees a nurse to check for irregular pulse and then record an ECG. And they also say it is recommended to interrogate pacemakers, but they fall short of saying you need to anticoagulate those patients, as I've just explained to you. And indeed, for example, the UK National Screening Committee does not recommend population screening for atrial fibrillation because there is no clear evidence that patients who are detected through the screening will benefit from the diagnosis. And I believe that the studies that I've just explained to you, NOAA and Artesia, will give some answers. And there are other studies, such as Stroke Stop, which is run in Sweden, that will provide answers to that question. Now, obviously, we have now um, a wealth of technologies that we can use to detect atrial fibrillation. And they run from blood pressure measuring devices uh, through to your smartphones, smartwatches, um, 
and of course the um, holter ECG recorders that have been in use for many years. One can split them into medical devices um, and you can include the uh, healthcare professionals taking the pulse in that. So automated blood monitors, single lead ECG devices, ECG patches, implanted devices, and consumer electronics. And those are the ones that provide most of the data now because they are available to everyone. And we all, or almost all of us now have smartphones and the majority of us are thinking about smart watches. So that uh, detection of heart rate through physiological sensors often using the photoplethysmography sensors on the devices enable detection of arrhythmias at a very broad scale with little cost. Now, one of the studies that has been published is the Apple Heart Study. You've probably heard about it. And Apple basically used the data of 420,000 of its Apple Watch consumers who bought an Apple Watch and analyzed their personal data and checked whether they had an irregular pulse. First thing to observe is that very few of these people had an irregular pulse, only 0.5%. That is less than what we expect in the population. And the reason for that is probably that the average smartwatch user is much younger than the average atrial fibrillation patients. The average year in the Apple Heart, uh, age in the Apple Heart study was 41 years whereas the average age of patients with atrial fibrillation is 70 years. And the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is much higher when you go further uh, into old age. Now, almost all of the patients with detected arrhythmias were excluded because they didn't interact with the Apple Heart uh, survey. And some of them also had other reasons. For example, they had already known atrial fibrillation. And they were then offered an ECG patch to check whether um, they had atrial fibrillation. And of the 450 probands out of the 419,297 who returned the patch, indeed a third, 153, were diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. So it's a big effort, but it makes use of available technology. But I think one of the key, two key findings for me are the age of these people was young. Almost all of them, four fifths were lost because of a difficulty in communicating. And yet they found quite a bit of atrial fibrillation. And it's worth to see that, of course, there was more atrial fibrillation detected in the patients who were older, but they were also those who interacted less frequently with the technology offered service. And I think that is one of the key things that we need to work on as a community to enable that um, these consumer electronic based simple ECG screening tools are used by the population who need screening the most. We have in the past developed a pair of apps that helps patients with established atrial fibrillation to manage their disease better. And we've had some experiences of how dialogue and interaction between a technological tool and the patient is important. Like we have learned in the last seven months how to interact uh, through screens, um, we have to develop ways to interact with uh, participants and patients through digital technology. And these apps may be one of the ways to do that, but I'm pretty sure we have to develop um, better ways to communicate with participants to ensure that we don't lose the 80% who don't reply to the initial survey. We are actually, uh, through the European Society of Cardiology, currently conducting a controlled clinical trial that tests whether a technologically enhanced educational intervention, primarily geared at healthcare professionals, can improve outcomes in terms of guideline adherent management for atrial fibrillation. This is an ongoing study and I hope we'll report it in two years. There is a lot that's going on in terms of research, and I think it's much required. I want to point out Renate Schnabel, one of my colleagues in Hamburg, who is coordinating a worldwide um, research project that tries to determine the best ways uh, of, uh, for, to screen for atrial fibrillation. It's funded by the European Union called Effect EU. And I want to spend a few minutes now explaining a little pilot study that we are starting 
Um, it's called Smart in OAC. And it tries to address some of the remaining challenges in using consumer electronics, in this case, wrist uh, band to screen for atrial fibrillation in at-risk populations. This is the outline of the study. It's led by a colleague of mine from Birmingham, and it's done in four countries, Germany, Poland, Spain, and the UK. We plan to screen 2,000 participants. All of them have to be above 65 years of age, and we want to do this in eight months. And we want to demonstrate that a screening, a, a technology-based, a technology ideally completely digital screening tool can actually reach these populations at a high percentage. How is the study designed? We'll initially invite people to participate, and that will be done through letters written to them, but also through electronic means. Patients can then register and agree and consent to participate in a fully digital process. This process can be supported by uh, living people in person as needed, but we hope that it works fully digitally. And the people will then agree to be screened, and you'll hear details of the technology in the next talk. And those in whom atrial arrhythmias are detected are then offered further ECG screening, for example, with, a, with an ECG patch. So we have to await these results, but let me summarize what I wanted to talk to you. Um, what do we know about technologically advanced screening for atrial fibrillation? First, it's obvious early detection of atrial fibrillation has huge potential to improve health for affected patients, but actually even on a population level by enabling early anticoagulation, also enabling early rhythm control, and early detection and treatment of concomitant cardiovascular conditions in patients with atrial fibrillation. Screening using current methods, and as doctors we are used to halter ECGs or ECG monitors or ECG patches or implanted devices, is resource intensive, is not very sensitive, it misses many people, and it requires expert analysis. So it does not only cost money, it also takes a lot of time. Technologically enhanced screening using consumer electronic platforms can detect frequent and infrequent atrial arrhythmias. And that has been shown uh, for several devices and several approved algorithms. So what do we not know? What do we need to find out now? We don't really know whom to screen or how to identify at-risk populations. Is it just elderly? Should we just screen everyone above a certain age? Or should we focus on people who've already had an event, stroke survivors, where the risk of recurrent stroke is the highest, but on the other hand, where something bad has already happened, which you want to prevent? Should we maybe consider to use biomarkers to enrich elderly populations or other populations for those with a high risk of atrial fibrillation? Or should we focus on those who come to our healthcare system in the first place? Or a combination of these? We also do not know, as I've shown you, how to react to rare and short atrial arrhythmias detected by screening. Should we only start anticoagulation after ECG documentation? What is the limit of normal? How much of a, a very short and rare atrial arrhythmia episodes can we accept as a um, within the norm? And equally important, where is the threshold where we would have to initiate therapy? And I do think that the ongoing studies, for example, NOAA and Artesia will give us answers to some of these questions based on patients with implanted devices. And my final point is that um, now in my community, there is there has been a bit of talk about how technology will replace healthcare professionals. I think that we will actually need more health professionals to process the data and to implement um, treatment strategies once we start screening at the po population levels. It's clear that the long-term monitoring of biosignals, I've talked to you about rhythm and atrial fibrillation, can potentially help to detect chronic cardiovascular diseases. 
but it also creates new disease entities. I've already talked to you about atrial hyoid episodes, and we need to generate evidence for that management. But most importantly, in my view, from a perspective of training and development of health systems and health professionals, health professionals need to revive and retrain old skills, including the art of integration information into good decisions and to navigate the opportunities and challenges provided by technologically enhanced screening. We as doctors, as nurses, as pharmacists have to relearn some of these old skills to cope and to integrate information from these amazing new data sources into care. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to comments or questions. Professor Kirchhoff, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, my team prepared some questions. Um, I would like to give you the first question. What is your opinion about the impact of COVID-19 to additional risk of thromboembolic complication of AF due to the fact of change coagulation status in COVID-19 patients? So let me first start with two general statements. One, COVID-19 was not entirely unexpected, but hit us really hard. And two, I'm truly impressed at the speed by which the global medical and scientific community has adapted to this new challenge. We now know that COVID-19 creates a pro-thrombotic state and that thrombotic complications during the acute illness are a major driver of morbidity and mortality in COVID-19 patients. And we have therefore learned how to treat them with anticoagulants during the acute phase. Um, I think there is actually another aspect. And when you look at countries, and I know most about Europe because that's where I live, uh, that were hardest hit by the COVID pandemic in the first wave, you find that the excess mortality, for example, in Northern Italy or in parts of Spain, is only in 50% occurring in patients who had COVID-19. And 50% of the excess deaths are due to patients who've never had COVID. And many of them die because of untreated heart attacks, undetected strokes, undetected atrial fibrillation, but also of an untreated cancer. So I think that the wider impact of COVID-19 on thromboembolic complications is actually, has been that we have by necessity withheld care from patients in whom these events could have been prevented. And I do think that we have learned how to use digital means to offer care during a pandemic. And that hopefully during the second wave that's now uh, starting, we are um, potentially in a better place to prevent these additional thromboembolic complications. Thank you. There, <clears throat> there's another question. Are there large scale AF screening programs on population level already in place or at least planned in Europe? Mm -hmm. If not, what are the reasons? So um, the, um, the, the Europe wide, there is a recommendation to do pulse palpation and opportunistic ECG screening. And I think that this is actually implemented in quite a few countries in Europe and for example, combined with routine health checks or with uh, flu vaccinations and other healthcare contacts. Several countries with established public health systems have judged that ECG screening on a population level is not yet ready for implementation. And I know that there are ongoing studies in Sweden that test a screening-based um, well, an ECG-based screening for atrial fibrillation and compare that with usual care so that I do think we will have more information on the um, societal impact and the benefits of uh, systematic ECG screening in a few years. And I would hope if these studies show the expected benefit that we will have a population-based screening programs in a few years. At that time, we may end up doing them using consumer electronics, which of course was not possible or not even imagined 10 years ago. 
So <clears throat> there's one more question. We know so much about the relation between AF and stroke. We have technologies to control heart rhythm like wearables and apps. So what is needed to translate theory of prevention into practice? This is a brilliant question and it's a big question. Um, I think the short answer is one, we have now data that early rhythm control therapy helps to prevent strokes in addition to anticoagulation in patients with recently diagnosed atrial fibrillation. And that is a new um, but important aspect of treatment that we have to implement now. Two, not everything that is detected by a continuously monitoring device has the same stroke risk as ECG detected atrial fibrillation. And it comes back to this concept of magnitude synergism that I've tried to explain to you. So in short, we don't know yet whether we should anticoagulate patients in whom we detect one or two short episodes of atrial high rate arrhythmias per year. And ongoing studies such as NOAA and Artesia and probably future studies implementing consumer electronics are needed to establish whether um, anticoagulation is beneficial for those patients. Those are, in my view, the two main reasons why we are not yet acting on everything that is detected by a smartwatch and also not giving smartwatches for free to everyone above a certain age. Professor Kirchhoff, Paulus, so there's, oh, so you, you generated a bunch of new questions. Okay. How we can overcome the challenge of e-health slash digital health literacy among population to facilitate implementation of consumer health informatics? Now, changing complex system is difficult and changing behaviors of people is even more difficult, but it can be done. Um, there are different barriers between consumer electronics and the data that are generated and um, the healthcare systems that are digital. My daily work is happening completely digital. And when I use a piece of paper, it is for my research, not to treat patients or to capture their data. But the requirements for data protection and data safety and data ownership for medical data are much higher than the requirements that are um, that we currently impose on um, manufacturers of consumer electronics. And therefore, it is difficult to integrate them from a data handling perspective. It has also been very difficult for the medical community to cope with the sheer amount of data that we can access. And this is um, something where I would say we as a medical profession and as, uh, as, it, as academically active um, physicians have a role to enable and enhance um, that. Uh, both of these things have actually been sped up a little bit through the pandemic because of the need of remote care, um, but there is still a lot to do. And thirdly, I think we need to accept that the um, vast promise of big data, including artificial intelligence in, in all its ramifications, uh, will generate interaction, will generate associations. And one thing that we have learned in medicine over the last 50 or 70 years, and I would say that cardiovascular medicine is one of the drivers of that, is that um, evidence-based treatment, one, requires randomized trials, and two, treatments work best when we understand why they work and which disease process they tackle. So that a lot of the big data science that is very exciting and currently going on is, in my view, hypothesis generating and will need testing and controlled clinical trials. Professor Kirchhoff, I, <clears throat> I'm very happy about this. It's really enthusiastic how I see the enthusiasm you're working on it but also the structure and also the critical questions behind that. Um, but I'm also happy. So thank you very much. Stay with us for the discussion.